Whenever an object comes nearer to our eyes approach it, we can recognize more details. The viewing angle with which an object is seen becomes greater. By means of a lens, our viewing angle is increased artificially several times and yet more details can be recognized. Even objects that are quite close can be seen clearly and in rich detail. The first microscopes, like this one made by Antony von Leeuwenhoek in 1665, were nothing but powerful magnifying glasses in mountings, with a needle on which the specimen was stuck. Stronger magnification was only attained by forming the image in two stages, as illustrated here in a book printed in 1702. The image produced by one lens is itself observed through a magnifying glass. This is what a two-stage microscope of 1665 looked like. And here is another variety, dated approximately 1700, with many adjustable parts. A modern microscope is constructed on the same principle. The tube carrier forms a portion of what is called the microscope support. This support is carried by a foot called the base. On this base there is a stage for taking the specimen or preparation. Other important parts are the revolving nose piece for the objectives and the tube itself, which takes the eyepiece or eyepieces. The mechanical adjustment consists of a coarse movement, a fine movement arranged coaxially with it, and the condenser drive, to mention only the most important mechanical elements. Now let us look at the optical parts. The mirror serves for diverting the light into the optical axis of the microscope. The illuminating apparatus comprises the condenser with its aperture iris diaphragm. Above the specimen is the objective, the heart of the microscope. The revolving nose piece generally carries several objectives. The last in this series is the eyepiece. All these optical parts, shown by broken lines, must be brought into one optical axis with very great precision. They can be moved with respect to each other in this axis. For this, complicated and highly detailed working drawings must be prepared. The parts are manufactured in accordance with such drawings. A short look into the factory workshops shows us, first of all, how a series of dovetail guides are made in one working operation on a three-spindle milling machine. And here is the negative to this part, the dovetail bed of the M11 microscope stand. Here a threaded spindle is being rolled under high pressure. Such a spindle is used, for instance, for the coordinate movement of the object stage. In another working process, we can see how a revolving nose piece for four objectives is being turned very finely using a diamond cutting tool. The machined, mirror-smooth surface of this very fine brass gleams brightly and can subsequently be chromium-plated without further polishing.
In another workshop, we follow the grinding of a ball race of hardened Swedish steel. This ensures the precise guiding of the fine movement of the microscope. Here the driving pinion of the coarse movement is being milled, this being done to ensure smooth working of the helical teeth. Or we see a six hole revolving nose piece being threaded. It is essential that this thread should be extremely precise since it later holds the objective which must be orientated to the optical axis with the greatest accuracy. In one of the many intermediate checks, the parallelism of the dovetail contacting surface with the optical axis of the case of M11 tubes is measured by dial gauges reading to one thousandth of a millimeter, that is, one micron. Here we have corresponding measuring of the contact surface of the revolving nose piece carrying the objectives. We see that the measured values come within the mark tolerance of a few microns. After manufacture, the separate parts are brought to the assembly department where we follow the assembling of a coarse fine movement for the M20 research microscope. This coaxial arrangement introduces many extra parts, but it gives many advantages to the future user of the instrument. The screw for driving the coarse movement is fitted on and secured with a lock nut. Then follows a thrust bearing consisting of hardened ground discs and also ball bearings. And finally, the measuring drum, together with the screw for controlling the fine movement. Then the ball race is inserted in the gearbox and fixed. The range of travel for the fine movement is about two millimeters. And now we pay a short visit to the optical workshops. All optical parts are made in the wild works. First of all, plates are cut with diamond saws from the blocks of valuable optical glass of many different sorts. These plates are then again cut into small plates of different sizes which are worked up suitably into lenses, prisms, or plain plates. Here is a small plate which is quite tiny but can nevertheless be scratched by hand with a diamond and broken up into still smaller pieces. Each of these glass fragments will become the front lens of an oil immersion objective, the smallest lens made by Wild. The small glass plates are then cemented onto small wooden rods. Afterwards, the edges are ground down on the grooved wheel by means of emery dust. Then, on three or four different shells, the grinding of the surfaces begins, this being done by hand in the case of the smallest lenses. An intermediate control with the testing glass shows whether the radius of the lenses is approaching the desired value. Lenses of larger size are made by machine. 
in polishing shells, as many lenses as possible are polished simultaneously. This process may last from a few minutes to several hours. The time depends on the degree of accuracy demanded. Let us return once more to the smallest lenses. Finished lenses about one millimeter in diameter are fitted into a metal setting. A cementing substance is applied. The lens is taken up and laid into the setting where it is fixed by the cement. Of course, microscope objectives consist of several lenses, in fact of complete systems of lenses. Each separate member must be cleaned with the greatest of care. Out of the long working process required for the careful centering, of the components of an objective, we see here only one single step, the centering of one of the middle optical members. The complete centered optical portion is then secured by a screw ring and inserted into the spring setting which protects the specimen and the objective. The correct threaded seat is now turned on the objective in order that the mechanical and optical axes may agree within the prescribed tolerances. Craftsmanship of a very high standard is required for such work. A final check ensures that the optical and mechanical axes agree within the permitted tolerance of a few hundredths of a millimeter. The objectives are then ready for sale. But now for a few theoretical considerations. For the practical man, the path of the rays through the microscope begins at the specimen. Then comes the objective and finally the eyepiece. In reality, however, the path of the rays starts from the source of light, the incandescent filament of the lamp. Then follows the lamp collector, condenser, and then come the specimen and the objective and the eyepiece. We shall now build a model microscope, replacing complete lens combinations by separate single lenses. The whole is built up on an optical bench and from all these separate parts we begin in correct order with the lamp and its incandescent filament. After the lamp, a lens is inserted, the lamp collector. Then immediately an iris diaphragm with variable aperture. This is known as the radiant field stop. The lamp collector now projects a magnified image of the incandescent filament onto a certain plane. There we fit once again an adjustable iris diaphragm. 
This is called the aperture stop. Then follows another lens, the microscope condenser. It projects the image of the radiant field stop of the lamp onto a certain plane. And in this plane, we place our micro specimen, in this case, a grid. Then comes the objective. It forms an image at a certain distance, a first intermediate image of our specimen, the grid. If we remove this grid, we see that our objective forms an image of a diaphragm on a nearer plane. On close examination, we can also recognize the structure of the incandescent filament, which is here shown once again along with the aperture stop. If we now insert a very fine grid, a ruled line grid, in place of the coarse one, we see not only the central image of the filament and aperture stop, but also at the left and right, still other additional images. This is the diffraction spectrum, of which we shall speak again later. It can easily be seen that the multiplication of this intermediate image is rarely caused by the specimen. But let us return to the intermediate image of the coarse grid. Not much further away, we insert the lens which represents the eyepiece and which forms the final image for us. If we now manipulate our radiant field stop at the lamp, we see that the diameter of the image field becomes larger or smaller. On the other hand, Manipulation of the aperture stop causes the image to become brighter or darker, thus altering its quality. The model microscope comprises the lamp, the illuminating apparatus, the specimen, as well as objective and eyepiece as the image forming part. In our stretched path of the rays, we have correspondingly the lamp with collector, the illuminating apparatus, the plane of the specimen, and again, the combination of objective and eyepiece. In order to explain still more clearly what happens in the specimen plane, we place a fluorescent glass cube between condenser and objective. This allows us to follow directly in the microscope how the light beams run at this position of the specimen. The cone of rays becomes more obtuse or more acute, narrower or wider, depending on the manipulation of the aperture stop. In the ideal case, this illuminating aperture, this illuminating angle, should correspond to the objective angle. Half the aperture angle alpha, or its sign, is known as the numerical aperture. This also depends on a factor n, so that the numerical aperture, n a, equals n times sine alpha, where n is the index of refraction of the medium between specimen and front lens of the objective. In the case of high magnifications, in order to have available as many light rays as possible for forming the image, and also to recover the lost rays, we introduce oil between specimen and front lens. N is then 1.5 instead of only 1.0, as in air, and corresponding to this higher index of refraction, we actually gain this difference of angle in image forming rays.
The resolving power of the microscope is given by the grid constant, D equals lambda over 2 times Na, where lambda is the wavelength of the light used when observing, for instance, blue, green, yellow, or red. With a wavelength of 520 millimicrons, the resolving power of the microscope with oil immersion amounts to 520 divided by 2.6 or 0.2 microns. That is, two ten thousandths of a millimeter. Up to now, we have dealt exclusively with the geometrical path of the rays in the microscope. But now, here are a few facts regarding light waves. The light rays that fall in the form of waves onto a fine gap are refracted in the gap. After passing through a fine grid, the light is propagated not only straight through, but because of diffraction and overlapping, that is interference, several maxima of diffraction arise. These produce the diffraction spectrum in the back focal plane of the microscope objective. An experiment with water waves demonstrates how waves are propagated concentrically from one wave center. At a gap, new waves with a new wave center arise, and we can clearly see what is to be understood by diffraction. Now if there are several gaps beside each other, these new wave fronts mutually influence each other. They interfere, that is, they disappear in zones. The waves between move freely further, not at right angles to the barriers, but at certain angles. Consequently, quite a number of maxima of diffraction are produced. In the case of the optical bench, the line grid causes three diffraction images of the light source. Of these, the main maximum of the zero order is in the middle, and the minus or plus first maximum at the left and right, respectively. For the diffraction tests on the wild M20 microscope, we adopt a cross-ruled grid as specimen. Here is the microscope picture. The auxiliary microscope shows us the back focal plane of the objective with the colored radially symmetrical diffraction images of the light source and the white maximum of the zero order in the center. With a small hole diaphragm, we can stop out all diffraction images except the maximum of zero order. As the image, we get from our grid only a homogeneous surface. Using a diaphragm with a slightly larger aperture, we allow the maximum of the zero order and also a subsidiary maximum of the first order to pass through. And thus there appears, at least approximately, the image of a grid structure. But only all diffraction images together show the resolved image of our grid, true in every detail. With similar fine and critical specimens, every one of our microscope objectives is tested in the final control. But also the mechanical parts are subjected to final tests, such as, for instance, the coarse movement, the fine movement, and the position of the stage 
with respect to the optical axis. Then the par focality of the objectives is checked. The results are entered in a test report and then finally the microscope is properly packed and is now ready to be dispatched to any part of the world and to render good service to its owner for many years.